on today's podcast. Stop focusing on bicycle lanes and do we have enough art on bridges and figure out, hey, do we need more cops downtown? Do we need more cops in this area? Do we need more police on the street? Mm -hmm. Will that help our businesses? Will it help our business owners feel safer? I'm an advocate for the entire city. The truth is adding value will never go out of style. This podcast is brought to you by iWatch Security. iWatch Security, get the savings and service that you deserve. Ready, Paul? I'm ready. All right. <laughs> Hello, and thanks for joining us for another Five Things podcast here on a Sunday morning with uh, Paul Fitz, longtime friend and business owner, and uh, uh, this guy loves politics, so it should be a great conversation. <laughs> Talking a little bit about what Paul would do if he was mayor of Raleigh. So thanks for joining us, Paul. Hey, I'm glad to be here, Brian. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we go back a little ways. I'm trying to think how we originally met. Maybe uh, through Linda? Let's see. Probably through Linda. Probably through I mean, Linda. we've got so many mutual, mutual friends. friends. A lot of real estate friends. Yep. Um, it's probably through that. Yep. Yeah. So I've got to know you over the years. A uh, good poker player, amazing DJ. Uh, some of your side hustles, but you've, you've owned a, a business and sold it and successfully, uh, and, uh, a, a rock star in the mortgage business for a long time. But, Thank you. um, so where are you from originally? You're from North Carolina originally, right? Born in yeah. old Rex hospital in Raleigh, North oh, wow. Carolina. I'm, One of the I'm few. from here. That's, I'm a commodity. All right. I uh, grew up in Wendell. Um, and then by the time I became 20 years old, I was a full-time resident in the city of Raleigh. I've loved it. Yeah. Okay. I've been as helpful as I can. <laughs> All right. There you go. Well, you've, you've been in the fight ever since I've known you as far as being pretty, pretty vocal and, uh, which sometimes that, you know, you, you make some great friends, you make some people that don't like you so much. I'm okay with that, but, but you're okay with it. But yeah. you, from, from a distance, a little bit of a distance, you seem like you're very principled. You seem like you're very reasonable and fair minded. Um, and I think that's, uh, I think that's what a, I think that's a good thing these days. It, it seems to be tough to find that. It just, uh, wow. I grew up, uh, my father mm -hmm. being self-employed, uh, there was not a day in the week where he didn't work. Uh, I learned that from him, uh, being successful in one industry, which was the mortgage industry, uh, has been a great blessing to me, but I even decided to branch out. Uh, you remember when I owned Honest Abe's, mm -hmm. uh, I was 50% owner of Honest Abe's and, uh, we sold the restaurant back in, uh, June of 21 made money. Um, but I wasn't a guy who would stand around and point. I mean, you saw it. I would bust tables. I would tin bar. Drag I would, out a pizza, yeah, take an drag, order, do whatever you got to do, <laughs> whatever yeah. it takes. It wasn't <clears throat> just a sideline owner. Um, and I wanted to show our employees about the work ethic as well. I wasn't afraid to take out the trash. I wasn't afraid to wash dishes in the dish pit. You know, I just wanted to be a, a lead by example kind of guy. And that's, I think that's the best way to be being obviously prior military. That's one thing they, they instill in you is, you know, the speed of the group is determined by the speed of the leader. Correct. You know, you set the example. Uh, if you want them to take out the trash when it's full, you take out the trash when it's full too. Right. Oh yeah. I was never afraid to do it. And if I said, Hey, take out the trash, it wasn't because I was afraid to do it. I did it, you know, before they saw me do it, if the owner says take out the trash, I'm taking it out. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So what got you? Uh, what got you into politics, and when did that start? Oh, uh, I blame my parents. Okay. Yeah, I blame them. Um, probably by the time I was uh, ten years old, I was out tacking up signs for. I guess back then maybe Jesse Helms or you know somebody who was uh, a friend of my family's at that time. And, uh, I stayed politically minded my entire life. Mm -hmm. Um, I may not have been the most active person for uh, a portion of my life, but I was still politically minded. Mm -hmm. Uh, I believe that when you earn, when you work and you earn, you should keep the majority of the money that you earn. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't have to spend it on things that are completely unnecessary or fr frivolous. Uh, you don't do that in your own household budget. Right. Why should your representatives do that? Right. So. And, and to me, that is a fundamental mindset. I was, uh, there's a guy that, uh, we've got a client, he's a classic Liberty on X Yeah. and, uh, I've started following his stuff and he's got a lot of great content. But one of the things recently was, you know, and this is obviously at a federal level, but taking money from the citizens here and shipping it off to other places around the world. Right is like a dad that has children starving, uh, but he's spending all his money at other households. 
He's taking his children's money and spending right, it. Right, right. <laughs> taking it from the kids, taking actually. Taking it from his if kids. If we're talking about taxes, yeah. exactly. So that's where it's like, you know, Wake County, North Carolina, should serve the citizens of Wake County, not somewhere in Austin, Texas. Correct. You know, and I, I think that there's a, that's a, it's, it seems obvious to me, but there's like this fundamental misunderstanding of, of government, you know, and this is my mindset as well as yours, uh, that Wake County should serve the people of Wake County. Correct. The city of Raleigh should serve the city of Raleigh. North Carolina Correct. taxes should yeah. serve the state of North, North Carolina. Carolina. United Correct. States government should serve the United States citizens. Yes. And I believe because we've been so prosperous, because capitalism does work and it's, it's, you know, not that there's, there's always pros and cons to everything. Right. But because we've become so prosperous, I think this mindset has developed that we can just spend trillions of dollars miscellaneously all over the world. Uh, well, Pandora's box was never just opened by the federal government. It was smashed, destroyed, just crushed. What? Here you go. Uh, it, it's one thing when you have a surplus, if you have a surplus and you feel like you can help somebody in a situation, I feel like that's that's a, a, a very thing to do. That's a very altruistic right. thing to do. Correct. Well, it it could mean you're also taking too much taxes. Could yes, of course. Right. But there's still the there's still the we're thirty three trillion dollars in debt in our federal government. Right. Thirty four, I guess, is is the number now. Okay. But uh, I know it's over thirty three. I know that. Yeah. So we're in debt. Right. And we're sending billions to Ukraine. We're sending billions to, uh, again, I know Israel can take care of themselves. I've seen it. But I think sending money to Israel or sending money to uh, Gaza or sending money anywhere besides taking care of the infrastructure here, taking care of our border, taking care of our citizens, our, our veterans, you know, our, our homeless. I mean, we should have a better focus and better direction on taking care of our own home before we think we can take care of other people's homes. Right. There's plenty of, there's plenty of issues in the United States that, that need addressing. I mean, the people of Hawaii that, that dealt with all that, they got the, what, the 700 bucks and like, yeah, you, you don't hear anything about it anymore, but haven't heard a word out of Maui, but we spent $2 trillion in Afghanistan over the last 20 years. Correct. And you know, I know this is not the content of the, the podcast, what we want to talk about, uh, on those levels, but, but it's a mindset. But it's a mindset coming back to the mindset that the government should serve the people of that area. Um, so I, I do believe that's a fundamental difference between like you and I and a lot of people, the way they think about things. Anybody who's been a business owner, they look at their budget. They look at their bottom line. Sure. They're not going deep in debt unless they make sure they're paying their employees first. And so if we're thinking about the person that doesn't think that way, generally what I'm going to hear is, oh, well, you're greedy and you're this and that. And it's like, no, that's not true. I, I would love to put my tax returns up against your tax returns and let's talk about who's greedy. It's I don't want the government doing it because we see it over and over. For example, when they're sending millions of dollars to Twitter to censor things to censor people to censor stories that benefit certain groups of people that's not a good use of my my tax dollar that has nothing to do with not being generous you know so those are the things where you know that's typically the only comeback that i'll hear to that type of mindset is that like i'm some greedy guy and we, we were literally just sitting here talking about i get a bunch of this mail because because i i do donate to causes correct and i got packages all over my desk here from stuff yeah. that's you we know were talking about that earlier yeah yeah so it, at the end of the day it, it's it that's just not the case right. i want i want government to do government things and stop manipulating people and serve the people any anytime anybody ever says you're greedy i would love to look at what they give in charity versus mm -hmm. what i give in charity right uh and yes uh i, I donate blood let me see what you do as well mm -hmm. you know i mean uh they're mm -hmm their statements of saying, oh, well, you just want to keep your money. No, I can do better things with my money than you or the government can. Mm -hmm. I can help more people with my money. Right. Yeah. And that's true. And uh, at the end of the day, I think good people are going to do good things with money and, and bad people are going to do bad things with money. Correct. Uh, and, and when you're in the government and you can advance your own position or advance your party's position, a lot of times you're going to do things when you got an unlimited budgets that, that, don't necessarily serve the people. It serves the the party or it serves the government. Or if you feel like, oh, well, I'm in a, I am in I can't lose my seat. 
I'll always be in this seat as long as I run. If you feel like you don't have a challenge to your uh, quote unquote authority, Mm -hmm. you're just going to do whatever you want. Right. Yeah, that's true. So that's, that's, I I think we're kind of jumping into one of our topics, which is mindset, (laughs) but, but it's true. And, and that's where, when I think about people that I would like to support, uh, in government or in office, there, there are people that, you know, again, I think I've said this before, but I'm not, I'm not a Republican, but I, I don't see how I could possibly be a Democrat either because of positions, because of mindset. And there are the rhinos of the world we were talking about, like the Liz Cheney's and the Adam King Kinsinger's or the Mitt Romney, who I voted for, which I can't stand the guy now. Right. Um, you know, these are people that are just, they're part of the machine and they're part of the self-serving machine from my point of view, based on the information I have. Yeah. And so, um, I'm not for them either. Right. You know, so I, I think that, uh, I mean, voting for Mitt Romney for me was definitely the lesser of two evils. Yeah. Why do I have two evils running for a president at that point? You know what's funny, though? It's because uh, I definitely thought he was the better of the two. However, now I think we would have got the same exact it, thing. It was the exact same thing. It was I just two different suits. Two, two different suits, two different parties. I think we would have got the same exact stuff. I really believe that now. Yeah. Um, and that's uh, that's part of the problem. Right. You know, people are tired of the state. I don't care if you talk to, to flaming liberals or hardcore repu- right wingers or, you know, we're all kind of dissatisfied about a number of things. And we shouldn't be, by right. the way. Uh, we're a prosperous nation. I believe the majority of the people in this nation work hard. Mm-hmm. And I believe that because of our work ethic and because of our populace, uh, we shouldn't be in the deep debt that we have. Um, we should be an energy producing nation, which we're not anymore mm-hmm. at this point. Um, and, and we're weak on things like our border. We shouldn't be, no other nation in the world. We spend money on other people's borders. It's ridiculous. More than we spend on ours. Right. And, and, and it's okay for us to spend money on their borders, but not ours. Right. So it's kind of uh, just, the hypocrisy just blows me away. Yeah. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, that's federal. That's really not your, your wheelhouse. You're specifically looking to, to, you got a heart for Raleigh. You always have. Um, and it's my hometown. Yeah. And so part of our podcast is, you know, what you would do if you were mayor, um, of Raleigh and let's just jump into it if you're ready. Yeah. Anytime. Yeah. Let's All go right. ahead and start. So we, we laid out five things and I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll go into several different things. We've probably but... named seven now. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the, the number one thing, and, and you've been preaching this for a long time since I've known you is public safety. Public safety should be number one on, on any city council's list. Mm. Uh, the fact that right now we spend more money on debt servicing than we do public safety should tell you again, going back to mindset, what kind of mindset we have on our current existing council. I will tell you though, um, this has been a decline in in our city council for the last 20 years, two decades. Uh, it will be tough to overcome to try to, to try to bring in the reins, uh, to stop frivolous spending. But one of the biggest things that we would have to do for public safety is we need to we need to broaden our tax base. We need to not tax more. I want to make sure that there's a definite difference between the two. One is, hey, all the people who are paying taxes right now, you need to pay more. That's one answer, which I don't subscribe to. Uh, the other answer is we broaden the base. We bring in more taxable revenue, uh, bring in properties that could be taxable. Um, and those are my focuses on bolstering public safety. Uh, it's not just about police officers. Hmm. We need probably 400 more police officers right now. Well, you've been saying that for a long time, how we're understaffed and obviously Raleigh's grown tremendously. And, you know, it sounded like it's been understaffed for a long time and it continues to become more understaffed. So in two decades, we had 800 police officers around 2001. Uh, now it's in the high sixes and our, our, population has doubled in that 20 years. So the Raleigh city population has doubled in two decades Mm -hmm. and our police force has gotten smaller. That is not a good recipe for public safety. Mm -hmm. Um, as you can plainly see everywhere, crime has risen. Mm -hmm. Um, there's been more assaults. There's been more murders. There's been more problems throughout the entire city. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's following a, a blueprint model for, you know, cities like, uh, Seattle, Portland, Chicago, New York, Boston, Philadelphia, 
when you run police officers out of these cities, crime becomes more rampant. Mm -hmm. And because we haven't done anything as a city or our city council hasn't had that mentality to bolster public safety, our crime has risen. It's, it's a problem. Well, I can tell you just, and again, for people who don't know, I own a security company and I can tell you we're hearing more about crime. I think part of it's our company's grown, but the other thing is, is crime is definitely up and the, just you're bringing up some statistics. I, I posted something recently. It was like, I want to say the murders are up like 40% over the last two or three years. I, I hate to misquote it. I shouldn't even bring it up, but it's up. The, the reality is it's up. Correct. The reality is we're hearing about things on a regular basis. We're, we're working with cops here as a security company on a regular basis. Their customers are calling in to try to get video off their cameras for something to happen across the street or we're, we're just having to deal with a lot more of that uh, than we have in the past. So it is what it is. It's, it's a result of, probably not enough police. Um, and Tom, our VP of sales, he's on, uh, he sits on the board of crime stoppers. So he has interactions with, uh, the, the city, uh, police chief and people like that. And one of the things that they were saying is the cops, when they're out there, they're so busy responding to things that they don't have the ability to just sit in a parking lot somewhere, which kind of deters crime in itself. Yeah, correct. Uh, a, pr a presence alone is a crime deterrent. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, people say, well, again, going back to the how can we pay for it? How can we pay for it? Uh, it's amazing how our current city council will raise taxes for a park, for Dick's Park, but they can't, oh, raise taxes for uh, police. And I'm not advocating for raising taxes. Right. But I'm just saying... You're just talking about the mindset. Correct. They can find money for a park, but right. they can't find money for a police, which is completely foreign to me. Mm -hmm. One is a necessity, the other is not. Mm -hmm. um, I think by the time Dick's Park will be completed, the city will have gone into either half a billion or $600 million in debt for that park. Now... For half a half billion, half a billion, half a billion, or six hundred million, somewhere in that five hundred to six hundred million dollar range, will be not just the acquisition of Dick's Park, but all of the infrastructure, everything that they're putting in place for Dick's, will be somewhere between a half a billion and six hundred million dollars. Wow, it is insane. That I want to make this statement very clear: Dick's Park will never, ever recoup the investment that we're putting into it. It'll never recoup the investment. And we're putting a lot of money into that park yeah. is not necessary, but we're doing it. Well, the, I guess the other side of that is like, it is nice to have a nice park and things like that, but the, but there is a cost to things, you know, and when you, you have a uh, lack in a lot of other areas, it's, it's about priorities, right? Right. I mean, the, ne the necessity here is to protect your citizens, protect their property. They're paying taxes for this already. Right. To ignore it and to act like, oh, well, you know, we're a growing city. Crime is supposed to, crime is supposed to increase while you're growing. Not if you increase your police force at the same time. Mm -hmm. It would be a deterrent. There's, there's blueprints out there for success. Well, personally, when I think about the government, like the number one thing the government is supposed to do in my book is provide order. We give you money to provide order. You protect our borders. You make sure we don't have militaries invading us. Uh, and you, you have the cops, you have the fire department, you have EMS, you have these services to protect the citizens. Correct. That should be number one. It should be. Right. Yeah, But uh, I'm not saying it is right now. Right, right. And it hasn't for literally two decades. It's been, right. it's been a back burner issue and it shouldn't have been. It's your prior, I mean, it's your priority as a city council. Yeah. So public safety is, is obviously uh, one of the top of your list. And the one thing that, the other thing that I would say to that is mental health services should be part of that conversation as well. It, it 100% is. Uh, it's something that we'll be talking about soon. Uh, transitioning the homeless population is a necessity in any growing city. Um, I believe that now, there now it is 2023. So when you say transitioning, transitioning. this is oh, yeah, from, be homeless, careful. from homeless to having a place to stay. I, I don't want to. <laughs> Oh man! Sorry, I, no, I, no, could, no, I yeah. couldn't. It was a layup. I couldn't you know, resist I, it. You know what? That was yeah. great, by the way. Right. No, uh, there there are two main types of homeless, uh, and one is you are disabled and you're mentally un, uh, incapable of taking care of yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean that that is one, but the other are people who have had hard times in life, or they've come you know uh, addicted to substance abuse. 
These people can be, you know, turned back into tax-paying citizens. They can they can be productive members of society. Mm-hmm. Um, the people who are physically and mentally incapable of taking care of themselves need to be uh, taken or helped find an area where they can be cared for, a group home or something. There are long-term care facilities for these folks. Now, I hate to go back to Dix, but when when Dix was decommissioned, that was a huge problem for our for our homeless population. Mm. And we really need to have the state focus again on on mental health for public safety uses. Which will help with the crime. Reduce it. And, and again, if to me, it's it's such a common sense thing. If you care for your fellow human, human which I, I would say 95% of us do for sure. Yeah. You know, these are basic things that there are folks out there that can't provide for themselves. If things are not firing right. Uh, on the way here this morning, uh, there's a there's a guy out there in a Spider Man outfit, begging for money, and he's jumping around and yeah, I don't know if he's shooting. You know, <laughs> you sure wasn't Spider Man. I mean, I mean, Avengers actually pay, but Spider Man, I think he was doing it for it, free. And again, it's kind of funny, <laughs> but it it's actually really sad. You right. know, it's a Sunday morning. This right. guy's out there begging for money in a Spider Man outfit, and it's like. You know, I, something's probably just not firing right, you know, yeah. that or he's trying to market himself in a really unique way, I guess. And, and you know, there, it's one we, or the other. I don't know if we're still filming in Wilmington as much. Maybe he's trying to audition for a role, but he <laughs> really needs to be about two hours south. So, uh, uh we have a mutual friend, Adina. Yeah. Uh, Adina was doing a fundraiser. She was, uh, she was raising turkeys for military families to help feed military families. And while we were outside her office that day, you know, people are bringing turkeys by. She was literally um, being berated. Well, the conversation began of, hey, da 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 da, homeless guy approaches her, starts, you know, and he started yelling at her. And I stood, I'm like, okay, we're not doing this, you know? And about that time, police showed up too. So it was okay. just kind of usher him away. But I was like, well, this would be a good way to start a campaign. So- <laughs> and that's sad. You're out there, you know, trying to help help people and you're getting berated by someone who, who needs help by somebody who needs help. Somebody right. who's probably on drugs, who probably literally just needs a couple of right turns in the right direction. And he can become a, a productive member of society. I'm sure. Right. Yeah. I love the saying hand up instead of handouts. Yes. You know, uh, and, and it might take a couple of handouts initially, but it can't be a system of handing out because then you just, you create, it's never going to change anything. The, the dependency cycle will go on and yeah. on and on. They're not better off. Correct. Because you yeah. just get And we're us. not better off. Right. Because Everybody loses. Again, we're, we're just sending resources to an area that's never going to... And I'm not, I'm not advocating just to say, hey, we need to be paid back for what we do. No. It's really a, a pay it forward system. Mm-hmm. If you're helping people out, you're, you're hoping, your hope is that they will become members of society who are mm-hmm. productive and they will help people out. Right. Uh, that's your hope. Well, that's the way it works. You know, it's a, it's like your a bank account. You, you know, money goes in cause money comes out. If you got too much coming out, it, the bank's going to shut your account down. Unless you're the government. Well, then you just go print more. Correct. And you, uh, <laughs> by the way, I love saying this inflation is the invisible tax. They spend the money. They don't, they don't tax us, but they spend the money. Our value of our dollar goes down. We lose 5% of our value of the money. And so they essentially just taxed us while they spent it and did whatever they want with it. Well, in the last few years, and again, going back on the, on the federal government side, in the last few years, remember, uh, the current administration decided that we don't need to be an energy producer anymore. Mm. That has been a bigger way on inflation than anything else. Sure. Uh, as a mortgage lender, I can tell you that the biggest reason for the spike of increase in, in mortgage rates is because we stopped becoming an energy producing nation. Um, the SPR has been drained. You know, things that we saw in the previous administration that were good for interest rates, more energy production, lower rates, the better the economy. I can't stress it. We saw the blueprint and and for some reason in 2020, we decided to ignore that model. So, Well... There's a whole lot to say with that, but I, I am curious. So, you know, what I've told people with the, obviously cutting back on en- energy producing, it's an environmental issue, so, supposedly. I'd love to I, I, <laughs> debate them it, in public. Yeah, and, and I would love to have that conversation as well. Yeah. But it's a, the reality is we all use gas. We all use petroleum products. We, I just put on some chapstick. That's right? petroleum. You know, uh, I mean, uh, you have, you have uh, shoes on. rubber shoes. Yeah. You've got plastic on you. You watch your glasses. 
Right. Uh, it's I all even, petroleum. I even had to explain to a, a feminist woman who had tattoos all up on her arm. And I said, what do you think that's made out of? I'm like, you're a walking billboard for Exxon right now. And she, she about lost it. But still, nobody understands where the material comes right, from. But, but is it true? You know, you can get mad at me all you want, but yeah. it's true. Like yeah. you're, you're fighting climate change, but you got a tattoo on. Like you're... You're, you're promoting what, it what all the live yeah. long day. The, the people who took kayaks out to to uh, protest at an oil dare. Like, by the way, it's made of plastic. Right. The ores are made of plastic. That's all made of petroleum. It, it's, it's amazing to watch these people protest what they use every day and think that they don't need it. Uh, the laptops that they use, how much petroleum, the, your iPhone that you carry, how much petroleum? Well, 80% of our electricity comes from fossil fuels. Correct. It's, it's, it's laughable to say that it's killing the environment. Uh, somebody said, oh, I have an environmentally friendly car. And I said, what wood is it made out of? Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, not to mention the, the lithium. I mean, you've got all these heavy, massive diesel running machines that are, you know, there is no perfect solution right now. Oh. And, and I just, it's hard for me to understand the mindset with a world that's surrounded and using oil. Why would we restrict our energy production here and buy it from somewhere else? That's... That's not helping the situation. We're still using it. The, the other thing is the, the only thing, in, in, in my opinion, the reason why it happens yeah. is because it's, it, all it does is weaken the United States, which in my opinion is the ultimate goal. If we're getting oil from the Middle East or Brazil or somewhere uh, and we're still burning it, didn't we have to transport that oil uh, across the ocean to get here? Who, who do you think is more environmentally friendly in extracting the product. Right. Do you think the U.S. would have better environmental regulations than Brazil or China or Russia or right. Saudi Arabia or anybody? We're still more environmentally friendly while we do it. Right. Why wouldn't we want to be our own producers? It, it seems like common sense to me. Yeah. And it's that lead by example mentality. I, well, it's, 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 we can, we can all agree. I, I believe we can all agree that, you know what? We all want a better way. You know, I, I want to eat better food, but it doesn't mean I throw out everything in the house and I have nothing to eat. Right. You know, so it's, it's a process, you know, we can work towards better solutions. Uh, and I believe there's a lot of companies that are doing that. Right. And, and they've been doing it for years. Right. If anybody in the world would do it effectively and efficiently, it would be us. It would be the U S we're the leader on everything. Right. Again, why do we enrich our enemies, the people who hate us and buy their product to fund their military machine to attack us? Right. It makes zero sense to me. Well, with all the again, we're we're talking federal stuff sure. here, but with all the with all the anti Russia type commentary that you constantly hear, uh, whether it's fake news or real news, by us reducing our energy production, we empowered Russia. They made them more valuable, you know, and and you know, puts Europe in a tough spot because they got to get oil from somewhere. So if we're not producing it, they're going to buy it somewhere. Yeah. And it makes Russia and the Middle East that much more valuable. Yeah. Under the previous administration, we were the world's exporter. And, and exporter, we should go yeah. back to being the world's exporter at that point. I agree. Yeah. If you uh, go to Europe right now, I stayed, uh, I was there recently for about 10, 12 days. Uh, stayed in two different homes for friends of mine. Uh, their heating bills, again, uh, everything's more expensive there. Gasoline, everything is right. way more expensive. Their heating bills were somewhere around six, $700 a month. <sighs> Mine is nowhere near that. Right. Um, and I believe if they were better energy producers, they wouldn't have that kind of, they wouldn't have that kind of drain on their financial right. life. And, uh, long story short, the last thing on that, and we'll, we'll get back to Raleigh because yeah. that's the, that's our reason for getting here, but it's so easy to get caught up in, in things that seem like the solutions are so simple. Well, it's a geometric uh, issue though. I right. mean, it affects us all at the end of the day. Right. You know, we've, and I say we, the current administration federally has been draining the strategic petroleum reserves for years now to artificially suppress the price. So as we're potentially looking at these wars with I mean, we keep pushing towards Russia and we're obviously in Ukraine and now you got Israel and Gaza, uh, you got Hamas and Iran, you know, China's getting more aggressive, you know, as we're, we're driving towards potential conflict. And it seems like, we, it seems from my opinion, it seems like the United States wants the conflict. 
we're not doing anything to de-escalate things. Kind of strange, huh? Yeah. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> like almost like the military industrial complex would love us to spend trillions of dollars with them uh, for more weapons and all that stuff. But as we're driving towards that, we've reduced our oil mm-hmm. as we're driving towards conflict. And we did that for political reasons, yes. in my opinion, Yeah, because we didn't want to produce more oil, but we wanted to keep the cost down. But the problem is there's only so much strategic petroleum reserves to Left. deplete. Yeah. I- I'm guessing they're timing it. So we have to stop doing that after the 2024 election. And then prices can r- dramatically rise up and that buys another four years of, uh, you know. 2024 is an election year, in case right. anybody hasn't heard. Right. <laughs> I'm sure nobody's, nobody's seen the TV lately, but right. 2024 is an election year. Uh, and as I've stated in my mortgage business, interest rates are going to decline over the next 11 months. I wonder why wow, right. that's going to happen. Temporarily ease the, plane, the pain. Probably yeah, by I mean, point or two. Yeah, correct. In other words, if you're, you're either going to create more animosity mm-hmm. doing what you're doing, mm-hmm. or you've got to create a little bit of a pressure release so you can hope to try to rewin your seat right. at that point. But what, what the current administration has failed to understand, and I cannot believe I'm saying these words, but I will say it. I'll give the Obama administration some credit. I'll give them some credit. Mm-hmm. At least they didn't try to strangle us from our own energy. Uh, if you, if you understand what the economy is like, imagine the economy as a three legged table and on those three legs, you have uh, construction, you have to build things, production, you have to make things and energy. You need it to produce all the above. Mm -hmm. If you kick a leg out from the three legged table, the table collapses Mm -hmm. and we have had an economic collapse because we've restricted our energy process. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I've been saying for a while that I, I believe, and again, this just as a business owner here in things, dealing with things, and I, I believe the economy is much worse than the average person thinks. That's just my opinion. Yeah. Uh, but when I see a statistic like, this was like 30 days ago, 6% of the cars, 6% of the auto loans are 60 days or late. Yes. 60 days late. Yes. 6%? Are yeah. you kidding me? It's high. I mean, that just tells you there's a lot of people out there hurting. Trillion dollars in credit card debt now. Right. Never seen that before. The most ever. Yeah. Which suicides at an all-time high uh, last year and, and 2022 beat it. Financial industry, financial distress is the number one reason for, for suicide. Right. Yeah. So so that being said, uh, obviously, we're not going to fix the world's problems today. But uh, gl- I like talking about it. It is fun to talk. <laughs> it's not fun to talk about, but it's 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 to me, it's good conversation and one of the things I would I would love to have conversations with people that disagree. You, right. You think we should restrict our energy? I'd love to talk about Tell it. Tell me why. Tell me why. Yeah. The problem is those folks don't engage. No. They don't want to talk about How it. How many polar bears can we save? Oh, by the way, there's more polar bears now than they've ever the population's been. population's tripled yeah. in the last 30 years. <laughs> right. Like, what, what are we talking about? <laughs> have you looked at this? So anyway, um, but generally, I, I think that's why people, like I, last, last point, then we'll get back to Raleigh. <laughs> I had a friend of mine that was telling me the inflation has, has got better under Biden. And I'm like, what are you looking at? Like, where do you get this? How do you come up with this stuff? And so I screenshot, like I just, it was a eight second Google search to find all three years right. and the previous years. And I'm like, what are you talking about? 2% from 12%. Oh, but by the way, it was 12, but now it's back to four. Okay. Yeah. And, and again, you can like Biden. You can right, think right. they're doing a great job. Or you can hate Trump. You, and you can hate Trump. <laughs> yeah. I'm okay with that. But, but if you're going to say something, I mean, where is your factual basis? You have no factual basis for what you're saying. Now what it is, and and I'm going to say these type of people, because I've got lots of friends like this. Sure. They have a, th- a mindset about something, about the way they think it is. And they don't like to see that it isn't that way. And when you point it out, it's, I don't like talking about this stuff. It's an emotionally driven thing. Yeah. It's like, well, well, why? Do you want to run yeah. around in a in a, in a illusion right. that, that something is the way it is to... You want the world to fit the way you think it should be? I'd rather call you a name for not thinking the way I'm thinking versus having the discussion about right. it. Right, yeah. right. So, I don't know. It's it's kind of fascinating to me that uh, there's a lot of willful negligence is the way I look at it. Mm-hmm. They, they don't want to... And I love these people, and they're good people. They're good-hearted people, but they right. just... They don't want to... They want to spout opinions, 
And then when you, okay, well, let's, you said this, let's dig into it. And then I, I could give them all the data in the world and they just, they don't want to hear it. Right. Being a numbers person sucks sometimes (laughs) because you want to tell them, Hey, these are numbers, 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 numbers. And then here's your opinion, not based on any of these. Right. Uh, So if the economy is better, show me, Yeah. tell me, what what are you looking at? I'm sure there's some things that would support it, Yeah. but I can probably give you a lot more. I mean, it wasn't until, it wasn't until last year I'd ever paid $5 for a dozen eggs. So public safety was number one, Yeah. um, which it should be because when you think about public safety, everything else comes after that. You're not going to have business owners stick around. Mm -hmm. You you see this all the time. Uh, We just did security for someone that moved here from San Francisco Mm. And we, so we, I actually, this is one of the sales calls, one of the very few sales calls I've done in the last few months, uh, cause it was a referral from my, uh, my business banker, Tim and, uh, Fidelity bank, by the way, the yeah. Amazing, yeah. great bank, David. Um, I know David Forrest okay. over there. Yeah. yeah great guy. Yeah. I mean, the great staff, everything. Um, there's the plug. Uh, they're not paying me for that either. Um, <laughs> they should be, yeah, no, but, uh, <laughs> Um, so in any case, they moved from San Francisco and of course it comes up. I'm, I'm just going to be as transparent as I always am, even if I'm at a sales call. But so we started talking about the crime and all that stuff. And they're like, it's even worse than you probably think it is. Really? I'm like, really? Cause I think it's probably pretty bad. Yeah. It's so bad. They shut down an entire mall out there because of crime. Right. And yeah. then you got, you got places like Starbucks that are shutting down places. Yeah. You got Walgreens and all these type of places that are shutting locations down because People are just stealing 800 bucks at a time, you know, just walking in, walking out with stuff. And how can you, it's already hard enough to run a business when everybody's paying for the product. Right. It's hard enough to do that. Right. I can't imagine losing a, you know, hundreds and hundreds of dollars every day. And so what happens is if you don't have the public safety, you don't have businesses, you don't have businesses, you don't have revenue. That's right. There's no revenue without the businesses because you don't have employees. They don't understand how the tax revenue comes in. You don't, government employees don't pay taxes. They live off of taxes. Correct. So it all starts with the business. Right. Everything starts with the business. Everything does. Downtown. uh, Well, you know, any, in any city in the, in the country, usually the downtown should be the heartbeat, you know, of the city. Mm -hmm. But then you, you go and you look at cities in the past, look at Detroit, Detroit's downtown at one time was a ghost town. Mm -hmm. I mean, a literal ghost town. So cities cannot live if their downtown is not vibrant. And I'm not, I'm not sitting here saying I'm an advocate for downtown Raleigh. I'm an advocate for the entire city. Mm -hmm. Um, And in saying that every part of the city needs to be served, but downtown, if you look at it now, crime is up. Uh, Look at my friend who owns Mike, who owns Vic's pizza downtown. He had his uh, windows broken out three times in a week. Uh, should again, these things should never happen. Mm -hmm. Um, Clyde Cooper's barbecue has been there since like 1938. They're looking at leaving downtown mm-hmm. Raleigh. Um, there have been a, a myriad of reasons of why this is happening. Um, but again, when you have a city council not looking at all of the symptoms, they can't cure it. Um, they need a better focus on how their tax base works mm-hmm. that pays them the money to make the decisions that they make. Um, they should stop focusing on bicycle lanes and do we have enough art on bridges and figure out Hey, do we need more cops downtown? Do we need more cops in this area? Do we need more police on the street? Mm -hmm. Will that help our businesses? Will it help our business owners feel safer? Well, I'll tell you what, I I just, we've got clients downtown and they've had lots of problems. Obviously 2020 was an absolute, you know, uh, shit show downtown. Yeah. You and I went down there after the riots. You reminded me of that today. So after the riots and stuff was tore up and I had friends that, you know, had their businesses jacked up and Mm -hmm. you and I basically got some work gloves and yeah. some, uh, walk down, let's some sweep brooms up some glass. and let's try to, let's yep. try to go help out. Right. Yep. So just try to do something positive, uh, to, to offset all that negativity. Should have never happened. Should have never happened. Yeah. And, uh, that was, uh, you know, I've talked to some cops and, uh, or, and former cops that used to be cops, but they, they're not cops anymore. Cause it's such a hostile environment. They're allowed to be vocal now. Yeah. They're allowed to be vocal. So we've had some conversations and I don't want to air those private conversations, but it seemed to me that uh, that at a local level they they were they were hamstrung. Yes, they were told to stand down basically. Right. Uh, but for that event, we could have called in uh, the sheriff's department. Could have been involved. Wasn't involved. Uh, we could have called in the highway patrol. We could have called in National, uh, Guard. National Guard. And even Sheriff Bizzle over in Johnston County said, "If you need me, I'm here to help." Mm-hmm. And none of that happened. Uh, I think a real leader would have not allowed the first brick to have ever been thrown mm-hmm. 
much less try to point fingers at who may have been throwing bricks or right. making the statement that she made the following day, which was crazy. But yeah, I don't remember this, the statement per se, but I, I remember the pallet of the picture of the pallet of bricks. Bricks that was downtown. Delivered. Yeah. Who yeah, delivered was, those? Yeah. Who delivered, who paid for those bricks? I'm curious. And, and how are they not up on charges yeah. for contributing to a riot? They knew what was going to happen if those were there. Right. They knew what was going to happen. Right. And uh, I would love to see the bill. Well, I'd love to see the bill. Yeah. yeah. I'd, and here's the thing. There, there's pictures of cities all over the country that had that. It was very coordinated. These weren't spontaneous events. You, right. you have to be completely uh, unaware of the facts surrounding all that stuff for all that stuff to simultaneously happen. And there was the, the cops that I spoke to that they knew there was a lot of people coming in from out of town. So a lot of these people were not even Raleigh people. Okay, so Marianne's statement the following day. We've arrested people uh, for the violence, uh, and they were mostly white. That's what her statement was. It wasn't that, that, was her, that was her statement. But okay. uh, I looked at the arrest records. They were mostly from out of town, and they were mostly registered Democrats. And she didn't say anything about that for some right. strange reason. So mm-hmm. if you're going to point fingers... Make sure you point them all in the right direction and not just say, oh, well, it was just one race doing the violence. Why know? bring up one demographic? Why Correct. Not, if you're going to do that, bring them all Bring up. them up all. So you, know, you had leave a it out. bunch of out-of-town political activists tearing up downtown Raleigh. No. I, the truth is, had I been mayor at that time, I would have not even allowed a bunch of downtown activists off their buses. And by the way, if you didn't notice... They were bringing in people from out of town and they were parking buses over by Red Hat Amphitheater. Mm. And that's where the activists got out of their buses and went into downtown Raleigh to do their destruction fest. Interesting. Yeah. I would have said Chapel Hill and Durham's that way. You can keep going. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting to me and and I'm guilty of this. And anytime I do a podcast with it, it has politics, like I should be more aware of what's happening at a local level. It's easy to get caught up in federal stuff. Right. But we, we really, because it's on the news more that, and that's probably part of it. You know, it's in your X feed and, and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, local politics really, you can make such a big difference, uh, in the quality of life of the people. You know, that's where it really hits hard. Um, but, uh, I really can't, the, the current mayor, I really can't say too much positive or negative. I, I, the only, the only, I know a couple things and they're, they're both negative. It was the way 2020 was handled mm. and, and all of that was really appalling to me. And, and that's not just, not just her. It was the sheriff. It was the, you know, the governor. It, it was a lot of people that to me facilitated the destruction and, and enabled that to happen. Didn't stop it. That's for sure. Didn't stop it. Did what wasn't proactive, wasn't reactive, just completely let it happen. And, and I, I mean, I would never open a business downtown. Mm-hmm. I'm just telling you right now after that and the way the trajectory of the mindset, cause we're going to talk about mindset again here in a little bit, the mindset of the people, like I'm not going to expose my entire livelihood in my, my financial well being to someone that will just let people come in out of town and destroy my place. And, uh, you know, here it is another election year. I'm, I'm anticipating some stuff like that happening again. The oldest business, the oldest business that was ever open and run for the longest period of time in the city of Raleigh was Briggs hardware. Uh, Evelyn who owns Briggs is now relocated her business to Emerald Isle. So the oldest business in downtown Raleigh is no longer in downtown Raleigh. That, that by itself should be a marker for everybody to understand Clyde Cooper's again, since 1938, Hey, we're leaving downtown. The biggest reason why is because you have an ineffective council. They don't recognize the deficiencies. Uh, and I, and I hate that local politics wants to get involved or engaged in, in, uh, engineering, societal engineering, such as, uh, Oh, well, we've got to focus on this demographic. We got to focus on that. Demographic. No, you should probably focus on the businesses that pay you taxes mm-hmm. to run your to run your city. Mm-hmm. That's probably what you should focus on. If you focus on business and you focus on safety, everything else will kind of fall into place. Money shows up for some strange reason. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's to me, you don't have to focus on a bunch of demographics. You focus on taking care of businesses and taking care of people. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe, maybe that's I, too simple. Do, do I care what your uh, orientation is or your gender, or your ethnicity? Are you paying your taxes on time? Right. Are, are you, are, you know, are you employing people? I care people? about that. You yeah. know, are you employing people? Right. You know, are you guys say, I mean, it should be all the basic fundamentals. I mean, uh, right. you know, one of my favorite coaches of all time was Lou Holtz. 
And I swear to you, Lou Holtz would always talk about getting back to basics. What makes you win? What makes you a winner? And when you, when you forget everything that it took to make you a winner and you start focusing all the, on the minutia, then yeah, you lose. Mm-hmm. And right now the city of Raleigh is definitely in a losing, it's in a decline. Mm-hmm. That's for certain. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's a, uh, and again, it, people want to address things. People want to change the oil when the, the, the engine has exploded. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like start, Your engine's locked up. start maintaining the engine and keep it maintained. You know, if you have a, if you have a $30 million jet, you don't, you don't roll the dice on maintenance. You maintain it and schedule it. Schedule yeah. It, schedule our it. city should be no different. Yeah. Um, so, uh, number two, uh, we wanted to jump into, you've got a blueprint that you think would be implemented uh, if you were ever, let's say, if you were ever if, mayor. If I were ever mayor, right. uh, the the blueprint, the city that I would follow of every other city in the entire country right now would be Miami. Mm-hmm. Uh, Miami has done the greatest amount of work that I've seen a city do as far as transformation is mm-hmm. concerned. If you go back to the Miami Vice days of the 80s and early 90s, I mean, murders, drugs. Miami was a, you know, the word we like to say shithole. Miami Mm -hmm. was a bad town. Um, Francis Suarez uh, became mayor, became the first Republican mayor of of Miami in 60 years. And his mentality was, we're going to bring in cops. We're going to reduce crime. We're going to reduce homelessness. uh, We're going to bring in a casino. We're going to, uh, we're going to make Miami a tech capital. Um, we're going to make Miami a, a financial capital and he, and Francis Suarez, I, I've never met the man and I want to, because I believe everything that he's done as a leader of a city in this country has been business focused, business centric. Uh, it's, I think Miami was the reason why the, the state of Florida became as red as it has now is because of Francis Suarez's leadership. Um, well, policies matter. It does matter, but he focused on the right things. Right. He focused on taking care of the people, mm-hmm. bringing in business, and he he did it in a way that everybody bought into. Mm. Uh, RTP used to be the tech hub of the East Coast. At one time, RTP was the tech hub. Uh, at best, right now, we're number three. We might even be number four right now. Mm. Uh, Miami is definitely number one. Uh, Boston is number two. And it's really a toss up between Alexandria and RTP right now. Hmm. Um, and I think Raleigh could definitely be back in the one, two mix hmm. again. But again, we took our eye off the ball. What brought in our population? What brought in so many businesses here? Right. What began the bolstering of our population and our infrastructure here was being a tech hub. And we're, we're not number one anymore. We're definitely a three, four at hmm. best. Um, uh, if you go back and focus on on your businesses, focus on bringing in police to, to shut down crime, mm-hmm. help transition your homelessness to where they need to be, mm-hmm. you make this a cleaner, leaner city, people will come here and they will appreciate what we have. Mm-hmm. Businesses will stay. Yeah. So that's the overall mindset is just, you know, it, it reminds me of uh, seven habits of highly effective people. You, you major on the majors. Yeah. You know, don't major on the minors. And it, I could see where it seems like a lot of, isn't it the natural cycle though? It's like when things are so good, you you start majoring on the minors, kind of like Lou Holtz, you, yeah. you know, when you get blocking and tackling and you start focusing on these little insignificant things and the blocking and tackling goes away, now you're getting smoked on the field. Correct. And so I guess maybe it's a human tendency that we start majoring on minors when things are going good. Well, they, they always say that great times create weak men. Right. You know, that's and, saying, yeah, and exactly. It's so a, true. It's the cycle all by itself. Right. You know? We, we have to go back to being, we, we have to strengthen ourselves. And if we protect those who are, you know, providing for us, right. I think it bolsters everything in the public already. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. So one of the things you brought up, which, which I really like the idea of is bringing a casino in. Cause obviously that was part of, uh, Miami's, uh, turnaround. It was, and, um, uh, it's something I've been working on for a while. Okay. Uh, I engaged, uh, with the EBCI, the Eastern band of Cherokee, uh, a few years ago. Um, the truth is their focus was squarely on Charlotte hmm. at that time. Um, it took about two years to convince uh, Chief Sneed, who is now uh, no longer chief, uh, it took him about two years to convince him that Raleigh was the place to be. Well, once I convinced him of that, now if you 
go talk to their lobbyists, they will tell you that Raleigh is their number one focus now. Um, but there's a myriad of reasons why a casino for the city of Raleigh. Mm-hmm. Uh, you already saw the last state budget. Um, they were trying to put casinos in areas like Rockingham County, Rocky Mount, Lumberton, Anson County. And I wish them all well. I hope they get what they want. Right. But you have to understand in three of those areas, the majority of the money is going to come out of Raleigh to go to those areas to help bolster their their economy when the truth is Raleigh could use better shopping and dining. Mm-hmm. Raleigh could use better entertainment. Uh, Raleigh is definitely a more focused city for such an activity. Um, you can look through before COVID, before 2020, there were several areas in Raleigh that were 24 hours a day. I think bringing in an entertainment uh, system like that will make more areas of Raleigh 24 hours a day, which again, bolsters employment. Mm-hmm. One of the uh, one of the talking points from uh, the the state senate, state house, state senate, the state senate, they were the ones who were trying to to um, enter in the casinos into the budget. Uh, I don't hate the idea at all, but to ignore Raleigh uh, is a problem for me. Mm. Um, and one of the things that I had mentioned to Tim Moore, who's the current speaker of the house, mm-hmm. and this is recently, I told him I said, you know, Tim the state of North Carolina owns 161 properties in the city of Raleigh. They pay no property tax. The state literally shortchanges the city of Raleigh, $150 million a year for property taxes. Mm. We need to broaden our employment. We need to broaden our tax base so we can bring in more money specifically for public safety. Mm. Um, One of the things that uh, they talked about uh, for gaming purposes uh, in the budget was that they wanted to implement a 22% tax in gaming revenues. Uh, the problem for that, though, is they had no earmark for where that where the funds were going to go. Hmm. Um, and if you look at different areas of the state budget now, I believe that Tim Moore and Phil Berger could start what we what would, they would call the Moore Burger Fund or something that would, in essence, be like the Powell Bill Funds. Powell Bill Funds are money that come out of the state budget every single year goes to every municipality, it's money to help maintain roads, right? Mm. I think if they did that with gaming re- revenues, they could take the money, earmark it specifically for public safety. Money that can go into local police, money that can go into state patrol, sheriffs. Again, bolster public safety and do it without raising taxes. With those revenues. Yeah, With exactly. those additional revenues. Yeah, you're not raising taxes. It's just an additional revenue source. Well, it also seems to me there's a couple of things that we've we've talked about today that that first off our debt is large at this point, right? The city of Raleigh is in uh, over two billion dollars of debt. Two billion in debt. Yeah. So, I just and they never talk about that on the news, but it never comes up. What's well, it's? I just don't understand how people are so comfortable paying that amount of interest. It, if you don't have to, we we've had such a successful, prosperous state for a long time, right? Uh, ever since I've lived here, it's been top five in the country in North Carolina. I mean, half of our clients are people moving from Northeast or California that they're fleeing those high tax There's areas. There's a reason why. They're, well, I know that. Yeah, that's yeah. another podcast. But uh, um, that being said, it's like we've we've had surpluses. We've why are we not paying down this debt? I just don't understand this appetite for debt. Well, so uh, the state did it. Uh, 2010 Republicans came in for the first time. They had the House. They had the Senate. Mm-hmm. Uh, in that period of time, the state was in 4 or $5 billion of debt to the federal government. And now uh, the state has erased the federal deficit, and they have a $5 billion surplus in their rainy day fund. They had a billion dollar surplus in their last budget. Um, and again, kind of one of the reasons why I was like, Tim, you got $5 billion in your surplus. The city of Raleigh is in $2.5 billion of debt. You're shorting us 150 million dollars a year in state-owned property. Help a brother out. You know we want to. Yes, we, the city of Raleigh is helping you guys have that extra cash in there. Correct. It's time to you know. Yeah, the old business model of hey we employ people and hey we bring in tourism is not working anymore because again we always t- I like to bring up COVID in 2020 a lot. You know because of COVID all the state employees who were coming downtown Raleigh spending money in restaurants and businesses and putting money into those mm-hmm. those business they're working remote now. So the the initial business plan has now been smashed. 
right? Uh, they're not they're not generating the revenue they used to. We don't have the tourism that we used to. If you go mm-hmm. to museums these days, they're not as busy in museums, right? We need to look at underutilized properties that the state owns to remove them, mm-hmm. to get them out of the city of Raleigh, to create taxable, usable, livable space. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't want to focus on some properties. And when essentially, I, they could sell that off to private companies. So the right? the plan that I gave Tim would would be a little bit different. Um, if there was a promise made by a developer to build a brand new prison somewhere down east, and you have to look at our eastern state Mm. which is relatively vacant Mm -hmm. there's a lot of land and hardly any people in the eastern part of our Mm -hmm. state uh cheap inexpensive land (laughs) abundant cheap inexpensive land uh so it's not like the prison needs to be convenient towards dick's park or something correct and why is there a why is there a prison right there at NC State, Pullen Park, and Dix Park? Why expensive is there expensive land? Spent not only expensive land, but what happens if somebody escapes? Right. He's in the middle of the public. Yeah. You know, he, he, that person who could be quite possibly violent could right. get to somebody pretty easily. Right. Um, I wouldn't want a prison right beside a university. That's crazy to me. It seems less than ideal. Right. <laughs> so, uh, part of the uh, the way I I approached it was let's find developers. Who are willing to build the state a brand new free facility somewhere down east where properties are cheap right right newer house more prisoners get it out of downtown raleigh and then tell that developer hey buddy this is yours now right develop this land we're going to tax you on it i, I think by itself would create um literally you know millions and millions of dollars of tax revenue for the city of raleigh yeah i mean it seems like a no-brainer it does, but yeah. I kind of wonder why the brains on the current city council haven't thought about these things. So what what would the what would the other side of that say? They just don't want to deal with it. Is there too much on their plate or something? They just they just go through their normal motions. The when status you, quo. Yeah, when you when you don't have people who can think outside the box, they just think in their box, and that's all they do. Okay. Uh, you. You need to shake up the city council, but it cannot be just one person. It cannot be just a mayor. It needs to be four other members of the council to say, yes, we're going to jump on board with this plan. Makes sense. Now, are there a lot of people there that have been there for a long time? There are a few. Uh, uh, Marianne has been there for a while. Corey Branch has been there for a while. Uh, Actually, several other of the councilors... Uh, I mean, I would say Jonathan Melton's been there for probably eight years ish. I, I can't remember all of their cycles. Okay. Stories, Stormy's probably been there since 2019, but I think the other counselors are relatively, again, not that they're, it's not whether they're new at it or not, but are they just going along to getting along and just saying, Hey, I'm on the city council. Yeah. Well, I think that there's always, I, I mean, you could say this in a relationship, you could say this in an employment relationship, a customer relationship. It's easy to get complacent sometimes. Correct. And you know what, it, it, if there's a, a major undertaking that's going to take a lot of work and you, a lot of, I could see where people, if you're maybe being a little lazy, right. you know, maybe, maybe that's a strong word, but maybe it's just complacent. Like you're focused on other, maybe you're focused on some minor things, whereas this seems like a good change that could be implemented to generate more revenues stimulate downtown because i'll tell you i just i'm a single guy i'm 49 but i'm a young you're spry. only 49 I'm yeah sorry. i know right <laughs> I'm, just um, I'm a young spry <laughs> yeah. you know guy and yeah. I, I like to go out a lot yep. and i don't go downtown what's the point you you're a north hills guy at this point right yeah pretty yeah. much north hills everything north you need. Yeah. yeah and so and then you got carrie with the whole fenton and, yep. and all that stuff they've created a great environment everything there. you need so you know downtown has lost a lot of that allure which uh you know it's unfortunate because it i don't think it should be that way it shouldn't be that way it, there should be a vibrancy throughout the city right and when you see parts of the city without that vibrancy then it makes you say well i'm just going to stick in certain areas uh, I, my wife and I, we go downtown occasionally, mm-hmm. uh, but really and truly we stick around North Raleigh a lot because it's everything we need here. Uh, safe. It's safer for safer. the most part. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, even some of my favorite restaurants like Winston's has been broken into recently. Yeah. So yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, so, uh, there was a, a little bunch of stuff got hit there. A uh, lot of restaurants and a lot of, uh, uh other, uh, st- uh, stores have been, when I say hit recently, apparently somebody has been 
uh, stealing cars to ram them into businesses now. We, we, we have a customer that's happened to. Okay. So again, this is coming back to the security, but by the way, we have solutions for that stuff. So, uh, there's only so much you I can do. I got solutions too. <laughs> yeah. Other than sitting there with, you know, a arsenal of, uh, right. weapons ready right. for someone, uh, cause that's time consuming. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, there's only so much you can do if someone's going to ram a truck into your building, you right. know, but there are plenty of things you can do to deter it. And this particular client had the, they had the big concrete the post concrete put posts. outside. Yep. We've got video monitoring. Anyway, I don't want to go down my security path, but, uh, no, it's, but it's important. Yeah. But, but not just video, but it's video monitoring where central station sirens are going off on the cameras, the right. central stations talking to people, you know, leave. Uh, or and they can dispatch just people hanging around the outside of the property. Anyway, um, so we were talking about Raleigh and the budget and debt and that sort of thing. So it sounds like you've got some ideas that you've already started floating to people. Correct. Um, to, to try to get some, just make some improvements. It's kind of uh, trying to be proactive even though you're not in a position to do so. Right. Um, you have to reach out to the right people. Uh, I believe that the people in the General Assembly are very open to you're reimagining Raleigh with the right leadership. The, the truth is the current leadership has not reached out with these ideas. Uh, I don't even know if they really understand how they have budget shortfalls every year until I brought up to, uh, again, Speaker Moore about the $150, $150 million short. We need to pay for cops. We need the tax revenue. If you're not fully using these state-owned properties to their most you know, if they're underutilized, then if you could move some out of this city, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. It would be able to help us use more expensive land, broaden our tax base, bring in more public safety. Right. It's not rocket science. It's math. Mm. I don't know. Math is racist now. I too, just, right? yeah. You knew that was coming. One, 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 one and one is three, obviously. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> uh, so that's uh, that's casinos. That's the blueprint, uh, public sector. Yeah. Uh, so number four and five are mindset and work ethic yeah. uh, that, that, you know, you got to have the right mindset. It's like you can see in professional sports or even college sports, if you want to say, but when you, when Nick Saban went to Alabama, everything changed. Yeah. One person, one leadership, the mindset, the vision, the work ethic, one person can make that type of a difference. You can go down the list, Dabo or Kirby smart or any guy. And, and I'm, you know, not just sure focusing directly on, college football you could talk it's about a great example mike shashevsky or anybody shanahan going to the 49ers correct or uh Harbaugh belichick you know right. in new england again if you have the right leader the good things will happen if you have somebody who takes the lackadaisical approach and and for sometimes i un i understand that the uh the mayor of raleigh you know gets 15 17 thousand dollars a year as an income it's technically a part-time job mm -hmm. if you treat it as a part-time job you will get the part-time, you know, aspects of it. You're not getting a full-time mayor. You're not getting somebody who's dedicated to changing Raleigh and to making sure it's safe. And you need somebody who focuses on it 24-7. You know, it's it's kind of interesting to me. I, I'm certainly not a guy that I'm certainly not a guy that wants to advocate you should make a lot of money in government service. You you should want to do this to, for your your community. Public more service. So. Public service should be for public service, not mm -hmm. to go in there and become a multi multi millionaire like so many politicians become. However, it is baffling to me that a mayor of a major of a metropolitan major, city is making seventeen grand a year. Yes. We can't find in the budget a hundred grand a year so we can get a full time focus. That doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, I believe that if you bring in the right if you bring in the right crew and you start doing the things that are good for the people of the city of Raleigh, I don't think they'll have a problem with you getting a higher salary for doing the work. But the truth is we need somebody to do the work and we don't have anybody doing that right now. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's just baffling to me. It's uh, cause, cause I believe if you are not, you know, let's say I sold my company and I've got millions in the bank. Like I'm not worried about making money and right. I would go into politics and truly just, I don't care about making money. As long as you use your example of life. Right. However, if you're not in that position and you aspire to, to do that type of job, you, so you're kind of forced to have a job outside of that. Yeah. It just doesn't make sense to me. You're the mayor of a major metropolitan city. Correct. You know, the, the mayor of a, a major city should be full-time. Should be compensated and focus on what's going on. I agree. Yeah. 
Um, and I'm not just saying this cause you're sitting here. It's just, it, it just, why would we not do that? If you have a part-time employee, you get part-time results. Yeah. No question about it. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's obviously something that I guess hopefully a lot of people could agree on. I, I think if they, I think if they actually see some results and they say businesses, if they see Clyde Cooper say, Hey, you know what? Things have changed. Downtown's better. Now we're going to stay. If you start seeing people say, "Hey, it's safer down here. I feel mm-hmm. better. Revenues going up. Revenues sort of going thing. up. I, hey, we've broadened the tax base. There are more people living in downtown Raleigh. Right. You know. Um, again, I'm going to talk about COVID 2020 one more time. Look at how many uh, business offices downtown are vacant now. Look at all the vacant space. What can we do as a city to try to explain to these building owners? Maybe you should now start converting." part of your properties into residential use, build condos. And the truth is I would rather know that I've got a 30 year lease on somebody Mm -hmm. rather than a 10 year business lease. Mm -hmm. That means somebody's locked in for 30 years. I can build off a 30 year model versus building off a five or 10 year model. Well, I hope somebody comes around in five Mm -hmm. years. You don't, you don't, you want somebody locked in for 30 years. Yeah. Well, the, uh, one of my favorite sayings by John F. Kennedy is the time to fix the roof is when the sun is shining. And so, you know, it's, it's not doomsday in Raleigh right now, but no. there, it seems like there's a lot of vulnerabilities that okay. uh, someone needs to be proactive with. The blueprints that we're following now are the, the Seattle's and the Portland's and you've seen what's going on in Seattle and Portland. Mm. And we need to get away from that blueprint. We need to focus on a, on a Miami blueprint. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. It's just two different mindsets really about the, the way to, to run a city. Yep. Interesting. And then work ethic. If you want to touch on that, I mean, you, you've always been a worker. I mean, since I was a little kid, I think we're both those typical boomers. Yeah. Like we've been working since I can, as long as I can remember, it was housework or mowing lawns or my dad said, you want something? Papers. Go get a job, right. go work for it. You know, right. my first car, I paid $200 that I saved for my first car. So, uh, you know, I've been working since I was a kid. Well, that was probably a real beater. <laughs> it was a 1966 Dodge Dart. Okay. It was All a right. slant six engine, which All you right. could fix with, you know, with uh, electrical or duct tape and right. be fine. Yeah. That's a good first car though. It was a great first car. Yeah. I sold it for more than what I paid for it. When I- there you go. <laughs> That's entrepreneurial that's 101. That's a good investment right there. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so obviously you're not afraid of work and no. you've got the passion for the city. Yeah. You always have. Um, and uh, let me ask you this. Just, I wish I could find something to disagree with actually, because I, I think it's a healthy thing to disagree and have conversations about, but we're kind of on the same page with a lot of things. Let's say that, uh, let's say that uh, you've got to work with people that don't think this way. Sure. H- how's your like conflict re- resolution? How do you think you would deal with people that, um, that maybe don't have the same vision that you do. I'll, I'll give you a, a prime example. And this is something that you and I have never ever touched on. Uh, the one current city council member uh, that I, I talk with, I have conversations with is Stormy Fort. Stormy is a Democrat, a lifelong Democrat. She's never going to be a Republican mm-hmm. like me. Uh, Stormy and I have conversations. We have bourbon together. Um, she will tell you, she'll tell anybody, that how she got on the council, a council member was removed. It was a uh, Sage Martin. I don't know if you remember this story. Mm-hmm. Anyway, he was removed and they had interviews for council members and stormy interviewed. And she said, she called me after she was selected and she said, I want to let you know that I'm a counselor now. And I said, congratulations. I heard. And she goes, no, uh, the reason why they like me more than everybody else is because I use one of your ideas. So if I can communicate with somebody who would would seem like to be on the opposite side of the aisle, and mm-hmm. believe me, if you meet Stormy and myself and you know anything about it, you're like, there's no way those two people talk. Uh, if I can communicate with her and I can you know, build a bridge with her, I can do it with anybody. Uh, hopefully, it will be a, a real bridge versus... Oh, we're looking for something to to throw at you, like they like uh, the media or the Democrats would do towards Just my friend Mark stuff, Robinson. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. You know, and that's the unfortunate thing about politics is that when you you got to really be willing to subject yourself to all kinds of nonsense and know that that type of stuff is coming, and it's really unfortunate for I don't care who the candidate is. Yeah. You know, but it's a uh, uh, it's an unfortunate thing, and maybe it never changes. I don't know. 
if you go to NASA and you're building a rocket together and you have two scientists and they're looking at the rocket and they're like, oh, we see the problem. It's right here. It's this fuel line. We right. need to replace this fuel line, right? It shouldn't have anything to do with politics. But if you put an R and a D on these two guys who are scientists <laughs> and you still, oh, well, that, it, uh, there's a hole in this fuel line. Oh, that, that fuel line's racist. You know, I mean, right. that, that, that's the argument then. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, anyway, well, uh, I appreciate you. We covered a lot of ground today, and I think we went a little longer, uh, but it's so easy to sit here and talk about this stuff. But We, uh, we could talk poker next time. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk a little <laughs> poker next time. But uh, best wishes to you. Thank you, And uh, thank you for coming in, especially on a Sunday. Oh, my uh, pleasure. Early, and we'll uh, we'll get this out to the public. All right. Thanks a lot, Brian. Thanks, Paul. Thank and you Thanks all. for joining us for another Five Things Podcast.